Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this new morning, for the time that we have to study together, for the light that you've been giving this movement. And we just ask, Lord, that as we continue to look into the, these things, that your Holy Spirit can enlighten our minds, that you can open our eyes to see wonderful things out of thy law. We pray for each person searching for truth, that you can speak to their hearts, that they can apply themselves in following you and obeying the light that they are given. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct in our study, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So we're, we're going to look at, um, we're going to get to Isaac and a bit more and his lines. I have a lot of things that I want to cover. So we'll see how far we get. But just, this is sort of a bit of a backtrack. So one of the things that we had talked about is that we could take the reform lines, and we looked at this with the cosmic line, and we had we had taken the golden lampstand, and we had taken each of the seven branches with the lamps on the top as representing the seven basic uh, way marks that exist from Eden lost to Eden restored. And I was thinking a bit about it um, while in bed, going over these reform lines and trying to see how they would fit together. And uh, I'll go here. So maybe I'll read this here first. So since I have it up, the golden lampstand, and thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold of beaten work shall this candlestick be made his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs and his flowers shall be of the same. So this is all just one piece. The six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like un, like almonds on the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to, to picture this. We've seen pictures of the candlestick. So we have the six branches, this, the, the main branch, the shaft, it goes straight up, and then... Um, as you move up, you're going to have on either side a, a branch, and that's going to happen three times, so that you end up with these branches coming out all roughly level, with uh, each having a lamp on top of it. But then it talks about these knobs and flowers. Um, so exactly what is a knob? If we look at this, this is not a word we use too much. It's a kaftor, a chaplet, but used only in an architectonic sense. That is the capital of a column or a reef, like a button or a disc on the candelabrum. So um, sometimes called the upper lintel can use that word too as kaftor. So it, it's sort of something that cap something or top something so when when we see these and these have these flowers so the knobs have their flowers and there shall be a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick so what does that mean these knobs under the two branches of the same, a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches. What does what does that mean? Any, anybody have any idea? Uh, three, three knobs for each branch. Okay, that's that's what it says. That's why it's repeating it three times. Is that the reason? Well, it just says 
within the branch, there's two knobs, and then you have the knob at the end of the flower. Okay. Okay. But why are they repeating it here? There shall be a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same. So they say that three times. According to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Yeah, it must be applying to each branch. Okay. So that would end up being that there's three knobs, including the one at the top from which you have the lamp itself, correct? Yes. Okay. That, I mean, and, and that lamp is going to be come out of this knob, right? So you're going to have the, it's obviously going to have a shaft and then there would be a lamp on it. And thou shalt make seven lamps thereof. They shall light the lamps thereof that they may give light over against it. Okay. So, so there's this idea of how this looks. And then we have this. So I just have a page that has a drawing of this somewhere. Okay, so this this person's drawn them. They've numbered the knobs, and they have a sim symbolic reference here for the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know if that's valid or not. Um, but you can see that they're they're also going to have uh, four knobs and flowers on the shaft, which I didn't quite get from reading um, Exodus twenty two there or twenty five, and um, but this is the idea that there's these each branch has has three of these, so they have all together twenty two knobs. I, I don't know if I saw that in the representation that I read there. Um, but this is generally correct. This would make sense to people. Any, any thoughts on this? This is not a subject that I've given a lot of study to, yeah. so I don't have a lot of thoughts. Yeah, but it seems to be... There are, I'm going to say there are three knops in the... Yeah, so oh, each shaft has yeah, three. Shaft and not, and not four knobs. Yeah, well, I couldn't. Three knobs. Oh. Yeah, okay. So most people put four knobs on the center one. Now, here's another picture. Uh, that one's got three. That looks like it's match up with the scripture. Yeah, so. So this one, this is the way I pictured it, it, is that these knobs here, that's where the branches come out of. That's how I always imagined it. And then you can see, since there is a knob at the top, this would give us the four knobs on the center shaft and the three on each of the, the other branches. This would seem to line up with it. So that's, so that's how I would picture it. So, so the number is correct. It's just I, I didn't picture it that way. Um, and, and it makes sense that the branches are going to come out of the knobs themselves. So you still end up with that number, but they just had them spaced differently. Okay, so now the idea here, so I'm going to share this other screen. So I was thinking about um, about this. So we have uh, this cosmic line, and we have these way marks on the cosmic line, which are each of them is a major reform line. And then what we had been looking at over the last week or so is uh, the beginning of literal Israel. So that is, we are taking this way mark. And we were expanding it. That is, we were seeing it as a reform line, which we hadn't drawn out yet. Now, this is just a suggestion. So if I'm going to take literal Israel, it's going to have a reform line. Now, the idea is that this reform line here connects to the next reform line, um, 
or this way mark connects to this one. And in this reform line of literal Israel, I have the beginning of literal Israel and the end of literal Israel. That is, it's going to end in the reform line that I would call Christ and his disciples. So that's going to be the reform line uh, from the birth of Christ until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, the one we're looking at presently is, is um, Canaan. So I, I named it Canaan, but this is the reform line that takes this reform line of literal Israel and addresses Israel and his 12 sons. So that's the beginning of, of literal Israel. And I've divided it in this way, whether this is the correct way or not, but we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the three messages. Joseph is going to be the fourth, right? So he's he's not technically on this line because I just don't have that part of it. And just like Christ and his disciples, you would see that the, the part that's going to follow is really the destruction of Jerusalem, um, um, which is the end of the world, and the story of Joseph is going to parallel that. Though the story of Joseph also parallels Christ. So you know, maybe this isn't the best way to do it. Maybe there's another way to do it. But this this is what I did just as a thought. Um, now, if I take the line of Abraham, we, we were looking at the line of Abraham. That is, this is in the line of Canaan. Abraham has his own reform line. So I don't know if I should do it like this, Genesis 15 and 17, other than I'm taking this first line of Abraham, but I'm not making each of these a reform line in and of themselves. Abraham's reform line covers the first angel's message. Isaac's reform line covers the second angel's message, both in its formalization and empowerment. And then Jacob has a reform line as well, which is going to be connected to the story of Joseph. So I'm not sure how, when we get there, we might see more of that, of how that works. Um, and so as I started looking at this, I thought, well, how does this fit in with the candlestick? So when we look at this candlestick, I don't have the knobs in here, but we can see that in each of these branches, there is these three steps. So the cross becomes the center of this cosmic line. And, and as I started thinking about it, I thought, well, I could actually in sense, I could branch these up. So I could take each of these and create another branch, right? Or another candlestick for each of these way marks on this candlestick. And the same thing for the next candlestick above, I could take each of the way marks and create a candlestick. So that's one way to do it. And that's the, you know, as I was going to St. Ives idea. You know, I met a man with seven wives. Seven wives had seven sacks, seven sacks had seven cats, seven cats had seven kittens. Kittens, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to St. Ives? And of course, there's only one, right? Because they were all going the other way. But in this idea, I started thinking about these knobs and what they would represent. And so maybe instead of going up and building uh, the structure upwards, that if I could look at each of these knobs, as reform lines. So I'm, I, I don't know how to explain it otherwise, but that this could represent um, in literal Israel to spiritual Israel, three main, because uh, you would have the beginning of literal Israel, and then you would have these knobs and there would be one, there would be literal Israel, and then one, two, the knob that joins in the center, three, four, so one, two, three, four, five. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. How am I counting that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so I'd have one here and three on either side. So that would be seven. I'm seeing the week of Christ right there on the top. Oh, yeah, right. well, yeah, you're going to see. So what we would have is we would have seven events that span 
literal to spiritual Israel. And then we would have from the flood, we could break again seven other events that somehow connect as Sunday law events. And then seven events again here uh, that aren't necessarily the same events above. That is, if we did this, we would have 22 reform lines that we would call major reform lines. Is, does that make sense what I'm, what I'm saying? Does anybody understand what I'm saying or doesn't understand? I hear you. Okay, but, but we haven't defined what those 22 events are. We haven't defined no. them yet. Yeah, we haven't defined them yet. But, but do you see the sensibleness of it? That each of the knobs represents the major reform lines that we have been studying. And any further thoughts on that? It's is it something we will come back to? Well, when I was looking at it, I was thinking that the knobs were like the nodes on a plant, if you ever seen the stem, and then their branches that are flowers or more leaves that will come out from that. So then I thought, well, the knobs could be the way marks themselves and the lines right. or the stems connecting could be the way marks. I mean, could be the, 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 the reform lines yeah. and the knobs the way marks. Yeah, because, I mean, how we would do this, I mean, here we have the cross. So if you just look on the cosmic line, I mean, we have literal Israel. And, and leading to the cross, if we're going to start with literal Israel, we would start with the reform line dealing with the 430 years. So that's going to be all of that history, including uh, Abraham, all the way to uh, the Exodus. And that would be this major light, this lamp in the cosmic line. But along, before we get to the cross, to the center stem here, we would have to have these other events along this branch that lead to the cross. And then once we get to the cross, we would also have to have these events that lead to spiritual Israel on the other side. So there would be uh, the center event is the cross. So that's going to be true of all of these branches, though it would be the aspects that relate to literal and spiritual Israel that would be marked here. It would be the events connected to the flood that connect the flood and the Sunday law that would be marked where this branch joins. And then it would be the event that refers that it's referencing the creation of heaven and earth, the beginning and the end that would also be marked here. So at the cross, we would expect four major way marks that thematically represent these four different um, aspects of the revelation of light that comes from the from the fall to the restoration so it's just an idea right it i, I haven't fleshed it out and it, it doesn't take away though from our other idea of the reform lines with the progression progressive destructions of four but you know, the question is, is it useful? Is it a useful tool, an analytical tool that could help guide us? Because it is a chiasm. It is something that we've understood that this branch candlestick relates to this message. Seems and, like it's something we should consider. Okay, so so it's something to consider, but it's just, just a thought, you know, as I was lying in bed, 
this morning thinking about this and then getting up this morning and studying it out a little bit more um, and that this might help us to some degree as an analytical tool. But sometimes, you know, things can get overly complicated in, in the world of analysis that maybe isn't needful. But I think it might help us to sort through some of this. Now, um, so when we go back to this one where we have the cosmic line, and this is more the, as I was going to St. Ives type of idea, that we can take each of these now and we can expand them out. So literal Israel has this whole span uh, that goes to the cross. And then we would have these three knops that would, or four, depending on how we're counting it. And that's, that's part of the, uh, the question that we would have. So I would think that there would be this main reform line that relates to literal Israel um, in this history. So that wouldn't be, so this would be Christ and his disciples. And, and we would have to understand what this is. And it may be mostly be the disciples, that is the 12 sons of Israel being 12 and the disciples being 12, they would relate to each other. So it's basically, how do we get from, from Israel, from the 12 sons of Jacob to the 12 disciples? Maybe that's what this will help us understand. But in that, we would also take this and divide it as a reform line itself. And you would have um, Israel and his 12 sons. Then you're going to have 977 BC. Whether that should be the center or not is still a question in my mind. Um, and then you're going to have, you know, 742 BC. Maybe this is part of the same history. Uh, the three decrees. How do we relate this as, um, and I have it as the empowerment of the second angel's message. So, so this is just, again, just a suggestion. And we're going to have to decide on these as time goes on, once we understand them better. And then this one, which I call Canaan, this is just this reform line, which would include Abraham's reform line, which is a part of this, that would be Abraham. And so I don't know if I should have what I should have here. I just wrote some things down uh, because I have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so how, and, and, and we were looking at Abraham's reform line as sort of an expansion of the first angel's message. So the formalization and the empowerment would be there. And then his fourth is when he offers up Isaac. So this is the covenants of Abraham. So this would be uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and Gen Genesis 22. Genesis 22 would be the arrival of the second angel's message. But in Abraham's personal reform line, it's going to be just the fourth of the covenants. Then Isaac has a reform line. So um, Isaac's reform line then would have these events, whatever they are, that would mark Isaac's reform line. So for Isaac, it's not going to be when he's when a when Abraham offers him up. That's not going to be the reform line because he's going to have a time at the end, which would probably be his birth. And, and then we would decide for Isaac's personal reform line. How do we decide what those events are? His birth, maybe the weaning, uh, maybe when he's offered up it becomes for him the empowerment of the second angel's message. And then we have Jacob's reform line. Now, in, in Isaac here, uh, one of the things we're going to have then is maybe the birth of, of Jacob and Esau is Isaac's uh, arrival of his third angel's message, or the fourth, I guess. Um, but does that make sense to people, what I'm doing? You're, you're presenting a good progression. Okay. And, and we can see there's a sensibleness to it. I mean, it's not, it's not silly in any way. I mean, it, it's logical. It, it shows that these reform lines 
produce, you know, the individuals reform lines produce uh, way marks that we can then put on a bigger reform line. But we can see that that bigger reform line is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph will be the fourth. So on this, I don't have the fourth um, being brought up. But you can see then for Abraham, his fourth in his in his reform line. So these, if you took Abraham, this is his first, second, and third angel's message, and his fourth. Um, so his fourth is Isaac's arrival. So Isaac would then um, have his own reform line. So it would it would end with Isaac, but not all the details of Isaac. That is for Isaac's reform line. This event for Abraham is not the same event as for the start of Isaac's reform line. And then these would be expanded out for Isaac. So that same event, the offering of Isaac, for Abraham, it's the arrival of the, the fourth angel, which is the second. But for Isaac, his, his being offered would be either the third, the arrival of the third, or the empowerment of the second, and that's what we'd have to decide. And then Jacob would have the same thing. He would have a reform line that would include things in the story of Isaac, but also end with the story of Joseph. And then the story of Joseph would be a reform line. So to me, it's very sensible, but you know, my mind doesn't work normally all the time. So you'd have to decide whether this is really what the Bible is showing, or is it just an artificial construct that I've created I don't see that it can be because everything seems to fall in place once we start looking at the details. And we should see as we continue going through all of this history, all of these reform lines, that they will fall into these, these structures that have already been established by this movement. So let's go to the scriptures here. Now, what we were dealing with yesterday was uh, the wells a little bit. I mean, we dealt with some other things as well. But in the story of Genesis, when we get to, um, let's get there properly. Abraham's going to die, and you're going to have the birth of Esau and Jacob. So, and, and we're going to get there a little bit. Uh, today we might get into some of Jacob's but what I was doing is I was looking at the wells and so we have Isaac and Rebecca and this is going to be that story which I had got completely mixed up um, where Abraham um, oh this isn't the one I'm looking at this is, this is the one I want sacrifice of Isaac let me see here Sarah's death and burial yeah, this is what I was looking at. Okay. Um, I'm getting mixed up again. Was it chapter? Yeah, this is the story of Isaac and Rebecca. So he's going to send his servant, and we read all through that. Um, and one of the things was the well, right? So we were looking at these wells. So that's what I want to get back to. Now, somebody had said there's 10 wells that are mentioned. And so I tried to go through this. And I don't know if I could corroborate that suggestion um because some of these wells i'm not quite sure of but um the first well that we have mentioned is this beer la la haroi however you say that which is between kadesh and uh barrett right and this is going to be um uh dealing with ishmael right so we have the prophecy of Ishmael that's connected here. 
And then we're going to have it mentioned again. And this is going to be Genesis 21. So we're going to have uh, with the birth of Isaac and then his weaning, Hagar is again going to be sent. To, this time she's sent out the first time she goes out on her own. And um, Ishmael is going to be 19 at this time. And, and again, she's going to come across a well. Um, so he's, she's going to see this, um, and her eyes are opened. So part of this had to do with the opening of the eyes. This brought us to um, ex, uh, that would have been Numbers 22, which dealt with a Balaam. And, and we could see that that's going to be a prophecy about Islam as well. And we saw that Genesis 22, um, when Isaac is offered, there's this parallel of the ass and the two servants. So, which we see in the story of Balaam. <clears throat> so we looked at the well and we could see that this well is the opening of the eyes because one of the word for a well is an eye. And that would be like a fountain or a spring that just comes out of the ground and you have this eye that then gives water like an eye would cry or water. And, um, and then we're going to see in the story of Isaac that Isaac is going to redig these wells that Abraham had, Abraham had dug. And, and we're going to see the same, uh, the Treaty of Abimelech, or the uh, covenant made with Abimelech, that both Abraham and Isaac make this covenant. And, and they're a lot of years apart. <laughs> um, I think somebody said like 100 years apart, but I don't know if that's quite, uh, that, that's probably around that time, I would think about 100 years apart. Uh, depending, you know, no, not saying exactly to the year, but about that long, that you're going to have these two treaties. So it's obviously not the same Abimelech and the same Phicol, but it is in Gerar. And um, so it's, it could be their descendants. And then we have, uh, what was the other thing? So we saw some of these parallels between Isaac and Abraham, but there was another thing I was thinking of. Well, it'll come back to me. So then we're going to have these wells. So, so they make this covenant. Okay, well, it's Beersheba. So Beersheba is the place. And um, in Abraham's covenant, there's the seven ewe lambs. So female lambs. And which of course represents that's Sheba seven and it's the well of beer Sheba and Sheba means also an oath or Shabuah uh, means to make an oath or to swear seven times. And, and that's also going to happen with Isaac when he makes his covenant. So that's going to be uh, Isaac and Abimelech here. So there's going to be, uh, this first time in chapter 26, where Isaac basically repeats the same um, error as Abraham. And Abraham does that both with Pharaoh and Abimelech. Isaac just does it with Abimelech when he's in Gerar. And then, uh, yeah, where is this other one? So we got... Isaac and Abimelech, and then he makes this. They find a well, and they're going to name these wells Essek, uh, Sitna, and Rehoboth. And then it also is again going to mention um, Beersheba. So how do we look at these wells? Um, what do they symbolize, these four wells? There's three plus a fourth. What do they symbolize, the wells? Well, 
Well, you're bringing out the three one combination. Yeah, so it's a three one combination. So, so Abraham has these covenants, right? So in Abraham, it's about these covenants that are made. In Isaac, he's going to have the symbolic representation of these wells. And there's going to be three. And, and you know, Essek means to strive. That's, and um, Sitna means to, to argue. Um, so it's a type of striving. Um, and then Rehoboth means a wide room or an open space, because he hath made room for us. And then, of course, Beersheba is the well of the oath or the well of the seven times. So how would we understand the symbolic nature of these wells that are redug, that Isaac redigs the well of his father? Anybody got? I'm still thinking. <laughs> okay. So we know they represent the three angels' message and in, in the fourth. So what does it mean that he digs the well of his father? He redigs these wells. Repeating. So he's repeating the message. So Abraham has a reform line, which is the covenants. And then Isaac has a reform line and his reform line, the symbol there is the well. Would we agree with that? That that would be the main symbol for Isaac. So Isaac gets his wife um, in chapter 24, when a servant is sent to, to get a wife for Isaac. And he's going to meet Rebecca at a well. So these wells show up in this story again and again. They showed up with Hagar and Ishmael. Now they're going to show up in the story of Isaac and Rebecca. So, so what do these wells mean? Why does Isaac have these wells? Because, because again, what is a well? We've talked about this before. And there's two different types of wells or words that are translated well. One is an eye or like a spring. And then there's another well in which you have to dig. Now you can dig the spring as well to, um, you know, to, to get the water more easily because the water may just be lying on the ground. But what is this representing? Can we, can somebody expand on this for us? Well, sometimes what God shows us is plain and clear, and sometimes we really have to tax our brains to find out what he's trying to convey to us. So that's yeah. like digging wells. Okay. So, so there is things that God has given us, truths that he has given us that, that just happen. That is, we don't necessarily dig for them. We may be obeying God and wandering and following his will, and we come across a well, right? So a, a spring, but there are times when we have to dig to look for water. Now, what about um, the symbolism here with Isaac and Rebecca, um, the, the idea of this marriage connected with this well? So first, the servant's going to be at this well, and then we're going to find that um, 
Isaac is going to be at the well as well. So Isaac, it says here, um, he's at the well of Lahairoi. You can never say that. A bear, bear Lahairoi, right? So that's the first well that's mentioned in scripture. And that's where Isaac is going to be. That's where he's going to dwell. So what's the significance of the first well and the second well? Isaac dwelling there and this marriage. I mean, I could tell you guys what I think, but that's not very useful. Well, um, Rebecca has this here. You have this here well, either side of her journey. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe the end from the beginning sort of connection maybe okay and um, well we can also see it as the first and second angels messages could we not and, and we know that isaac is um is the second angel's message in this bigger reform line. So we're going to see a lot of doublings with Isaac. And, and doublings have existed in, in this whole line of Abraham because he starts with this in Genesis 15 with this chiasm. So the chiasm is a doubling. Now, what about Rebecca? What about the idea of marriage here? Um, we touched on that a little bit. Abraham had failed in a test. And we're going to see the same thing with Isaac, though there's some differences. Well, we have said that the marriage connects with the midnight cry. Okay, right. Which would be part of the second angel's message. Right, so, so we have this, the message of the second angel's message is the message of the marriage. But what does that mean specifically? Why, why is this, what's the significance of this marriage? Because the message of the second angel is a warning about the Sunday law. Is that not also a marriage? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, church and state. But it's, it's an unholy union. Where God's people are called to a holy union. So there, there's this contrast between the true marriage and the false marriage, which is, is dealing with the Sunday law. Now, there's... Now, it's going to talk here about Ishmael um, and, and in chapter 25. And then about the birth of Esau and Jacob. Now, I just want to go back to this uh, situation with Ishmael. And so there's a bunch of things that are missing, but we're going to have to come back to them. Okay. 
Um, okay, I'm going to go back. Okay, so we'll just finish off with Ishmael. So Ishmael lives how long? According to verse 17 of Genesis 25. 137 years. Okay, and what's the significance of that? The 137 years old. Well, a quick few of the uh, descendants of Levi. We're 137 as well. Yeah, so it, you're going to run into this number quite a bit. People living 137 years old. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it, but it is a common number, and, and it might mean something that that I haven't seen yet. Okay. Now we also know that Ishmael is going to have 12 sons, right? So it's going to list the sons of Ishmael. So we can see one is there's also this counterfeit. Now this is of course the sons of Ishmael, um, but you're going to see later that uh, Jacob, who's the son of Isaac, he's going to have 12 sons. So there's going to be this number 12 and 12 is the symbol of the covenant. So God uh, has these other numbers of 12, even with something like Ishmael. Now, then we're going to see, um, uh, they're just going to go back over the generation of, of um, and, and we're going to see things in Isaac's life. So to me, Isaac is represented by these wells. But we're also going to have events in Isaac's life that are connected to Jacob and Esau. So we know that Abraham has Isaac when Abraham is an, a hundred, and Isaac's going to have, um, he's 40 years old when he takes Rebekah to wife, it says in verse 20. And then he's going to, 20 years later, he's going to have uh, two children, right? So and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So for 20 years, she's not going to have any children. And the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out all red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So Isaac's gonna have Jacob and Esau when he's 60. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Of course, we're all familiar with this story. Esau selling his birthright. So he comes from the field, he's hungry, um, and Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, What's the significance of the birthright here that we've talked about? What what is what is the birthright? Being the priest of the family of the line of Christ and inheriting double of the father's wealth. Yeah. So you so you get uh, to be the head of the family like the kingship but also the priesthood. And, 
and the double portion. And, and that's going to be of the line of Christ. So this is, this is the seed promise. And we know that um, through Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then he's going to have Jacob and Esau, these two sons. But one is going to despise the birthright. And of course, we see this same sort of pattern. We have Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau. But let's also, let, let's look at this in, in one other way that you brought up the other day. Okay. Because we're looking at Genesis 25, 33, right? Yeah. So, and Jacob said, Shabba to me this day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is this not another representation of the seven times? Yes. So again, you're going to have this seven times connected here. Right, so that and that word there is yeah, Shabbat. Um, so it's just basically a, a variation of the word Shiva. The consonants are the same in Hebrew. So it's the context that decides how you pronounce it and what it means. Um, so, so we have the seven times mentioned in connection with this prophecy. Let's call it a prophecy. And Jacob, of course, is go going to then deceive Isaac to get the blessing, even though Esau had already sold it. But it's also that this was already promised to him. Yes. So, so it's, it, it's, you know, the story of Jacob is, is a troubling one. Um, we know his name means supplanter. Um, and, and in English, generally, if, if somebody, well, we use the name James. So James is the same as Jacob, how it changes so much uh, through these different languages to get to James from Jacob, but it's the same name. Um, my middle name, supplanter, right? So, um, so this is Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob, of course, then inherits the birthright, and he's going to be the last of that line that does so as an individual. That is, he's going to divide that birthright amongst his sons, and he's the 22nd generation from Adam, and the 11th generation from the flood. So we have to remember those details. Okay, but <clears throat> is Jacob also not setting aside the covenant that was granted him at his birth? By trying to get the birthright or in what way? Well, first, he's going after the birthright of his own power. Right. In his own wisdom. Mm-hmm. He's not letting God lead in this, just as Abraham did not let God lead in the situation with Sarai in front of Pharaoh, Sarah in front of Abimelech. Okay. So, so we see in these reform lines, we see failures on the part of the individuals that God or the movement that's being illustrated. So, so that's right. a, char a characteristic of every reform line, that there are failures. And sometimes when we look at a progressive destruction of four, um, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference whether we're looking at a progressive destruction of four or a reform line, in that they both have some of the same characteristics. They're both three one combinations. So in this story of, of Isaac, so when we're looking at the story of Isaac, the birth of Jacob and Esau, I'm saying is, is this um, the arrival of the third angel's message in Isaac's reform line.
Now, one thing we don't see here, um, at least it, in sort of uh, as clear as we see in some of the other ones, is um, a well. We see that where he lives is by the uh, Ber Lahoi Rai. Lahoi Rai. I'm going to have to practice that one. Um, and then you're going to see that there's going to be all this period of time until his wife gives birth. And then she's going to have uh, Esau and Jacob. And there's two nations, and the elder shall serve the younger. That's, that's the prophecy. But And so Jacob and Esau both would know about this. But we're going to see that Jacob is going to try to maneuver to get this to happen instead of just trusting God's promises. And then we're going to see this, this famine in the land. So we're going to go back to the story of Isaac, right? So you have the birth of Jacob and Esau, and then you're going to have this story of Isaac and then Isaac and Abimelech. And then you're gonna have um, the wells. So how, how we put the story of Jacob and Esau into this story, um, they don't seem to necessarily be connected but this is going to mark um, for Isaac, the end of his line. This is gonna be the fourth for Isaac. And then it's gonna mention um, so this is gonna be Beersheba again with Isaac. And then it's gonna mention and Esau was 40 years old when he took it to to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and Rebekah. So why does it go back to this story of Esau and his wives? Does this not <clears throat> provide us a point of comparison with the way that Jacob approached things. Okay, um, can you expand on that? I mean, Jacob does a lot of bad things, but there's some things he does well. So. Okay, you have a, a pair of, you have a set of twins, right? Yep. One twin decides to enter into covenant with the world around them. Mm -hmm. The other twin enters into covenant or tries to enter into covenant according to God's order. Mm -hmm. One twin enters into covenant that is bothersome to his parents. The other does what the parents would want him to do. Okay. Yeah, so, so even though Jacob has flaws... He's still obeying his parents. Agreed. Even though he deceives his father and things like that. But he's still trying to do what's right here. Well, okay, here, here's Jacob. Yeah. He listens to his mother. Yeah. So he accepts the guidance of the church, even though he knows that that guidance is not according to God's plan. Okay. So the movement right now is not looking to accept the guidance of the church. The movement is looking to accept God's will and God's leading. Right. But they, you have to go through an experience to come to that point. All right. Right. So, so Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's trouble. Yeah. So, and, and that's the thing about Jacob is, you know, who exactly does he represent? 
because we're saying that Jacob is the third angel's message. Okay, but the, the with the time of Jacob's trouble, isn't that that he is facing the angel of the Lord or Christ, and then is doing so because of his con, his considered frustration and fear of his brother? Right. So, so as you see, we start to move from Isaac to Jacob. We can see that the two stories are connected, but we're going to see that Jacob becomes very, it's a very complex story, much like Abraham's. Isaac was a little simpler. Uh, Jacob has a lot of symbolism in it that some of it we're familiar with and some of it I think we're not. Um, but the question that we have now, so I'm just trying to see how much time. So when Isaac blesses Jacob, this is the deception. Isaac's old. He doesn't know when he's going to die. So he tells Esau to go in and get um, some venison. So hunt a deer, make the savory meat that I like so that I can bless. My soul may bless thee before I die. Genesis 27, 4. Now, Rebekah hears this when Isaac spakes to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat, etc. Now, so he's told by his mom to do this. Um, and of course, we know the deception on how that works. And, and so he lies to his father. And Jacob said unto his father, I'm Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou hast badest me. I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul may bless me, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Right? And then he's going to, you know, check out all the signs. Um, he kisses him, right? And then he's going to receive this blessing. Therefore, um, he says, he came near, kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him. And he said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field, which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine that people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now, in doing this, if, if um, Isaac believes that he's blessing Esau, is he not discounting the prophecy that God gave? Yes. Okay. So, so, Isaac himself is here being disobedient. W would we say that? Yes. Okay. So, so it's a rather complicated moral tale. It's not, it's not as straightforward. I mean, Jacob is deceiving his father Isaac, but his father Isaac is not following what God had said. Because he's saying, you need to be Lord over thy brethren, thinking he's speaking to Esau. But it's really Jacob that should take that position. So, uh, you would have some we, thoughts there? Would we also state that because both Isaac and Rebekah are setting aside what God had stated, the yeah. covenant that God had stated regarding these two sons, that this is church and state both going against God. Yeah. Now, the problem with Rebecca is that she's just not trusting that God's going to take care of it. And Isaac is not doing what God stated would be done. Right. So, so you end up with this compromise. On, on both of their parts. Well, maybe Isaac, I don't know if it's a compromise, but for the church, it feels it's doing the right thing because God's not working the way that they expected God should. Now, if we're going to take that to um, 
something like the Evangelical Conferences in the 1950s. This is where the church, when it when it's because the church is supposed to be looking for the Sunday law, and the church thinks that if it negotiates with evangelicals and so forth, that there's somehow, and, and we could see this, it's not explicitly stated, but it it's it's manifest in Adventism that somehow we can avoid the discomfort of the Sunday law if we compromise. And, and, and they do it as a, a pretense that, you know, this is how we are going to witness to the other churches. They don't want to be seen as a cult. So but if, yeah. if, if they're at that point in time, are they also not trying to say, you're not going to go against us because we're one of you? Yes. Degree. yeah yeah that's that's kind of the idea yeah. so these these compromises with the world now now we also have jacob and esau here so i mean jacob and esau represent two classes so you you got isaac and rebecca in this context jacob and esau represent um these two classes that that happen under a three-step testing prophetic message, right? It develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So in the story of Isaac, we can see that Jacob and Esau are part of that reform line of Isaac. And that's, that's sort of the point that I'm trying to, to show and illustrate that Jacob and Esau represent this movement at this time that is in a reform line of Isaac, you're going to have his wells that are going to be these um, three angels messages. And the fourth, which is Beersheba. But then it's also going to be illustrated in his sons, the history that we would call the fourth angel's message, or Revelation 18. So it's going to be our history illustrated. And we saw that also in the story of Abraham, that is, the offering of Isaac is that fourth. And we're going to see in the story of Jacob, the story of Joseph will be that fourth. So it's, it's linking these reform lines together, which is part of a bigger reform line. Now, we also see that there's this covenant. Um, so in this reform line, um, we see this covenant. So Abraham's about this covenant and this promised seed. And this is all about this promised seed. So this is going to show up again in all of these reform lines. This, this um, blessing or the birthright or the promised seed is going to keep showing up in these stories because that's the whole story of the Bible is about the promised seed. So you're going to see that thread run through all of these reform lines from Genesis 3.15 all the way to the end. Now, when Esau comes in, it says, Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who, where, who, where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. So does Isaac know who it is? So he knows that Esau is now come in and he realizes he's been deceived, but he says he shall be blessed. So what is Isaac recognizing? 
I think he recognizes that uh, he's done God's will unintentionally. Right. Yeah. So he's he's done God's will unintentionally. Even though he meant to bless Esau, he blessed Jacob. And that is God's will. And he understands that. Now, Esau asked for a blessing as well. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety, this is Jacob, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he, and this is Esau talking, um, for he hath supplanted me these two times, and he took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And a Isaac answered and said unto Esau, behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for, for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shall serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, proposing to kill thee, or purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then will I send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said unto Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? So once again, we have lots of information here. Okay. Um, so this blessing of the birthright that Jacob receives is the promised seed, right? So he's going to, he has this birthright. Now Esau, of course, is only interested in the temporal blessings, not the spiritual blessings, right? He's interested in the double portion but not in the part dealing with the priesthood and the promised seed. Correct? Yes, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. So um, we know that when it comes to Esau here, this would be um, Now, Paul talks about it. Okay, I'm going to read three references here. Uh, Romans 9. Um, so this is Paul in Romans. Uh, it was said unto her, that is Rebecca. Um, well, let's go back even further. Verse 8, verse 7. Okay, let's go back there. Verse 6, let's go back to verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So all those that are descended from Jacob are not all descended from Jacob, right, or Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So he's going to use this illustration of this promised seed. And he says, 
You can have some people that are descended from, from Jacob or from Israel, but they're not all Israel just because they're direct descendants. And then it goes even back to Abraham, because in Isaac thy, sh thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And we can see this with Jacob and Esau as well, right? For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So that's going to deal with Isaac. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. And when he talks about election here, what is that talking about, just uh, by the way? Is, is that not about the birthright, the spiritual birthright? That's a good way of looking at it. Okay. Because I think that's what he's talking about, this choice that God has chosen, um, who he's going to bless and who he's not going to bless. Now, of course, there is a whole doctrine of the election, which has to do with predestination, uh, which the Bible doesn't support. but. That's how, when people see that word election, um, you know, usually a certain group of Protestants, they're going to see that as having to do with predestination. But it says here, I, I always, what's that? Excuse me, Theodore. I always thought it meant that it was the choice that we made, like we choose to be chosen. We choose to walk in the path that God offers us. No. Well, no. The election is God's, God choosing. So it's it's referencing here. Um, and that's why he says, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So that is, is an election on God's part. Right. And it says election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. So God has chosen um, to demonstrate who it is that he has called. Now, of course, we all have a part to play in that. So God, you know, there is no predestination. People all make a choice. It's not like God makes the choice for us. But, but anyway, it says, as it was written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Um, so we can see that there's this purpose in which God has in how he has chosen. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Uh, Hebrews 11. Um, now this is, the, of course, the, the faith chapter. And we can see all these things that happened by faith. When Abraham was tried, offered up Isaac, that he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he receiveth him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Now you can see here this, this whole line here, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. Um is is this they're 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 receiving the promises seeing them afar off but so they haven't received the promises but they're they're trusting in the promises this is righteousness by faith and this promise is the promised seed and and the next reference to esau that we have here is um Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be a fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So that's what we were reading there earlier in Esau asking to be blessed. 
Now the blessing then that comes, or maybe it's more like a cursing, um, that Esau ends up hating his brother for. Um, thou shalt serve thy brother, it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Uh, what is this a reference to? Why, why does Abraham say this, or not Isaac say this, about uh, Esau? What is he referring to? So the elder shall serve the younger, but is Esau, is, are his descendants going to have the dominion? At some point. Well, he stayed home and he, he had what he wanted where he was, I guess. I mean, he stayed with his parents, where, whereas Jacob had to flee. And then when they, they seemed to make up, when uh, I'm thinking of Jacob returning there, and they seemed to, you know, they were hugging and everything, they seemed to have a peace about it, and then they departed again. Okay, so, for them personally. For, yeah, yeah okay. so you're saying that this refers to um, when thou shalt have the dominion, you're referring to at that time in Jacob's life when he's fleeing Esau? Well, no, he, he fled and then he he was coming back, right? And he had all his flocks and herds and wives right. and everything with him. And then they seemed to make up. There seemed to be a path of peace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so it could refer to that. I think it does, but it, but I think there's a lot more to it too. Yeah. Um, so so we know we know if we can look up Edom, because Esau is Edom. I mean, there is going to be in Second Kings 8, 20 to 22, in his day, days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zaar and all the chariots with him. And he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. So you're going to see these periods of time where um, the Edomites are going to be independent. But uh, but I think I think you're probably correct in. Um, In this sense, I mean, we don't really see Jacob personally controlling Esau. They're at peace with each other when in their latter part of their lives, they're not enemies. So the when the elder serves the younger, that's going to be more in their history, not so much in their personal lives. So I'm not sure. You know how to there's still lots to sort out here lots of different words that um that's when you got to get out of esword <laughs> yeah well you know also this terry right so terry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away so his going to laban uh rebecca says as terry so there's this tarrying time, and, and, and there's going to be lots more here in the story of Jacob. But we're still trying to finish the, the, the line of, of Isaac, right? So even though we're, we're running into the story of Jacob, we can see that this relates to Isaac himself, that Isaac is going to bless Jacob. And Jacob, in this sense, then is going to represent that fourth. But once again, Jacob has his own reform line. So to look at Jacob's reform line as an independent line, 
Um, we're not going to take the same events in in Jacob's lives that that occur in Jacob's life as being the same way marks as in Isaac's line. So, so I'm going to try um, to draw out Isaac's line a bit uh, before our next study. And then we're going to try to look at Jacob's line. So next week, we're going to start to look at Jacob in more detail. A any final thoughts or comments? Um, it, it has been helpful. People have sent me some emails that and and comments on uh, through Messenger that are very helpful uh, to try to look at this history. So if you do have any comments, feel free. You can even on the videos themselves. You can always write a comment on the video if you watch it. Anybody watching these videos, um, some suggestions that you may have here. Okay. Um, yeah, just noticing some structures. Okay. I can add up to the uh, Diabolt history information, but you have uh, Jacob and Esau being born when uh, Isaac is 60. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the Jacob and Esau separate when they're 77. Right. And then you're going to have another 60 years then until. Uh, Esau dies. So you have um, 60 either side of that 77. Okay, so so that, okay, so so Jacob and Esau are born when Isaac is 60. Okay, so if um, Jacob goes to Laban when He's 77. Yes, and he comes back when he's 97. Yeah. And so yeah. you can either, you can even divide that 60 into 20 and 40 as well. You have okay. a mirror because you have it's 20 years before. Uh, well, Isaac, he marries Rebecca when he's 40. And so you have 20 years there before they're born. And so yeah. then you have that 77 and then you have 20 years then when Esau and uh, Jacob get together again. Right. So, after the, after he's with Laban. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at um, um, Mahanaim. Yeah, so you have uh, just like a, a chaotic structure there. Yeah. Yeah. And if you could, you know, sort of draw some of these things out, they could be helpful. I can, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you can see them. When they, when they separate, Isaac is 137. Well, well. okay. <laughs> that number 137 shows up again. Mm -hmm. okay. As a, is there a is there a prophetic significance for us that Esau married at 40, 40 yeah. and Jacob at 84, that there's a 44 between the two of them? Yeah, and, and also Esau married when he was 40. Well, that's what I just said. Oh, okay, um, but you said Isaac. I'm sorry. Yeah, both <laughs> Isaac and Esau married when they were 40. Okay, but what I was trying to say was Jacob at 84, Esau at 40. So there's a 44-year period between the twins oh. entering into covenant. Okay. Okay, yeah. And uh, Isaac's 144 when Jacob marries. Okay. So, yeah, that would... That's interesting. Another representation of the 144,000, possibly. 
Okay, yeah, and we know that Jacob gets married in the middle of two periods of seven years. All right, to Leah and Rachel. Okay, so again, we have we have a lot of information that we're gonna have to as we we go through this, draw on lines, sort it out, and see its relationship. And so the chronological structure is important. It really helps us to see some things as symbols. And uh, so, you know, we're going to have, of course, the study tomorrow. We're not going to definitely be finished this. We're, we're still lots to do. Stephen, you have a final comment? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. It's just your, you lit up. Okay. Let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you once again for this study. We know that we can feel a bit overwhelmed with the amount of information, all these people and circumstances that we are somewhat familiar with, uh, but to understand the relationship of these different parts and where they fit into these structures, we ask, Lord, for your continued help. I pray that you can be with each person who's studying, that you can bring the conviction of sin upon them, and the power uh, to walk a holy life. Help us to trust in you. And thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.